Good morning, church. You are a lively-looking bunch this morning. Hey, it's great to have you guys here at Grace Community Church. We're glad to have you here worshiping with us. Looks like we've had an accident over here. Come on, Justin. Get it together, man. Get it together. No, hey, we're glad to have you guys here. If you're a guest with us, we'd love to get to know you. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do that. One, you can download our app. on the. Uh, it's called Church Center. You can download that through your app store. It's free. Uh, anyone can use that app to connect with us. Uh, if you don't want to download an app, you can also scan this code that's on the screen or go to sundaygrace.org. And on that webpage, you will find today's uh, e-bulletin. It'll have today's pastor's uh, sermon outline as well as an opportunity to give and connect with us. So that's an easy way to do that, okay? It also has uh, our announcements. There's three that I want to highlight this morning. One is Operation Christmas Child will be starting up next month. And later in the service, you're going to get to hear more about that, what that ministry is, and how you can be a part of it. So I'm going to save it for later. Uh, Grace 101 is our uh, uh, new membership class. If you'd like to become a member here at Grace or just learn more about us at Grace, then you can sign up for that. You can sign up digitally through the Church Center app, or I think you, you can also sign up through that uh, bulletin on sundaygrace.org. If you don't want to sign up digitally, just come see one of us, and we'll make sure that you get signed up. But that's going to be on Sunday, November 15th. It's a one-day class. It'll happen at 10.15 after the first service. And then the big announcement that we have today is you'll remember that I, I said this was tentative all the, all the time, that we were planning to start Sunday school on the 28th of October, or, or the, what's that? I thought it was the 20, whatever, whatever next Sunday is. 24th? 25. No, guys, come on. 25. Justin, yell at me to get it together. Uh, whatever next Sunday was, 25th, was when we were scheduled to start uh, Sunday school. Hopefully that is not happening, so we're gonna delay that start until we get all our ducks in a row. If you would like to be one of those ducks, come see me. But, uh, but we'll let you know when uh, we are gonna launch that. For, for now, it's to be determined, okay? Hey, we're gonna go ahead and pray, and then we're going to uh, worship our Lord, amen? All right, let's pray. Father God, you are a good, good God, and it is good to be in your house. And God, I pray that we would uh, right now tune our hearts to you and worship you for your goodness and for your glory. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand in worship?
Glad you're here this morning. You guys ready to, to worship? Did you guys see what happened on the plaza last night? You didn't. Who said that? You see it? On the news? No? Nope. All right. Well, there was a, there's this guy named Sean Fuke, and he's a worship leader at Bethel in Redding, California, and he's been touring the country, hitting all of these cities that have had problems and it's called riots from riots to revival and just these pop-up worship events so we got down there and they asked me to run sound for them and i brought my pa system out and showed up at mill creek park by the plaza and was greeted by a black lives matter rally <laughs> well they had the park until four but we were supposed to be in it too so that was going to be interesting but we set up and we and I don't know how many people showed up, thousands. There were several thousand people there. And uh, we baptized 43 people last night, which was pretty cool. It was fun. God is so good. And uh, he's great. darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken oh, great are you Lord yet your breath in our lungs so we pour out Pour out our praise in your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise in your You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we Lord, 
of worship where we can gather as your people, as, as your children, and just sit at your feet. Lord, we thank you for the, the love that you show us, the grace and the mercy that you extend each day. And Lord, we just sang, open the eyes of our hearts because we want to see you. But God, I know that sin cannot stand in front of you. So I'm not sure we know what we're asking sometimes. You are so worthy of our praise and honor. But if we were to look upon your face, I know that uh, we'd just be totally destroyed. But Lord, you've made a way for us to do that through your son, Jesus. And we thank you for the sacrifice that he made. So God, we just give you this time. We ask you to open the eyes of our hearts as we look at your word this morning, as we we learn about you. Help us to understand the, magn the magnification of your glory, the, uh, the magnet, just the magnitude of your glory. Lord, that's the word I'm looking for. You're awesome and you deserve it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, see. This year has been a pandemic year. Children are hurting all over the world. People are afraid, families are scared. People have lost their jobs. They don't know where to go, what to do. They don't know what hope they have for the future. Well, I want every child to know that God loves them, that God has not forgotten them, and that he cares for them very much. And when you pack a shoe box and send it to Operation Christmas Child, it gives us an opportunity to give that box to a child and do it in Jesus' name. Can you just imagine the hope and the thrill and the joy when a kid opens up a lid like this and all these toys are in it? It's an incredible gift. And so I just want to say thank you. We need your help this year more than we've ever needed it because of the pandemic. It's just going to create a lot more opportunity. Thank you and God bless you. And remember, pray for the children of the world. This one is for you from Jesus. Jesus loves you, my friend. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. I received these gloves that I really love. It's my favorite color, <laughs> yes. And I received this awesome mask that I'm gonna scare my little sister and brother in the night with. <laughs> yes, and this pants. And I'm gonna use them in every book I have for school. And these awesome <laughs> socks. And yeah, I just love it. It's like, <laughs> it brings this feeling to my heart that there's somebody out there that wants to share God's word. And even though we feel lost, that God is not there, that yes, God exists and he hears our prayers. <laughs> Thank you. So if uh, you guys have donated before, thank you. Um, this year we're going to be uh, doing a, 
larger capacity of uh, the shoebox collection. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, having the semi trucks here and loading them and bringing them from other places. So we need a, a very large amount of helpers. Um, <clears throat> I spe specifically, uh, my, my greatest need will be to uh, be able to fill the void of people that can lift 40 to 60 pound boxes and load them onto a semi truck. Um, so uh, we've got sign up sheets out on the table out there and my wife or I will be out there. Uh, we're really looking for help. It's uh, November 16th through 23rd. Um, I think we've been doing this forever, uh, for quite a while. Um, here at uh, church, we've been doing it about 20 years, roughly, uh, maybe a little longer. Um, and uh, every year I get to hear stories of how this changes kids' lives forever, eternally. And uh, last year I heard a story from somebody that went to uh, out on a distribution and they said uh, they had over 112 of the, the uh, youth or uh, kids at the school raise their hand and ask for Christ in their life. And uh, you might think, well, you know, maybe a lot of them did it because their friend did it. Maybe they got caught up in a moment. How many of them actually had a, a serious connection with God and the Holy Spirit and was transformed or changed? Let's just say one did. Last year, they had over 60,000 distributions like that. So it's impacting the world. And when they bring these things in, they're just not, uh, these shoeboxes in, they're not, just not leaving them and leaving the kids or, or the people to make the decisions on their own. Um, they're following up with a discipleship program that's connected with people in the local area that they provide for the kids. So it's, it's um, this year alone, they're looking at planning a thousand churches through this program, just through, through the shoebox distribution. So, um, in the midst of all the things that look like uh, it's hard to see God and the love of God, it, uh, this is something that I get to see and I get to hear where Jesus Christ uh, and the uh, gospel is still reaching and, and changing people's lives for the good. So, uh, you guys, I just ask you to pray with me real quick. Uh, Lord, I pray that. Uh, you would provide the work uh, every year. It, uh, this is one of those things where I see the work. I see uh, uh, the harvest field. I, I know that if we get these two boxes to other countries and they get distrib distributed, that uh, it's going to make a difference in uh, kids' lives and they're going to be changed eternally. So I pray that uh, you would provide the workers again. And I thank you that uh, you allow us to uh, be workers alongside you in the work of... Uh, bringing people to you. In Jesus' name I pray and thank you. Amen. Thank you, Nick. You haven't been doing it forever, but it may seem like that. They've been doing that. They've been faithful to serve in that way. Open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 1. We're still in that book, and I feel, still feel like I just got to talk to you um, and open up just our minds to what Paul is trying to say here. It, we didn't plan it this way, but there's kind of a theme already this morning about how much God loves us. And my introduction this morning was going to be this. It just fits in the theme. If you're a parent here or if you've watched over people you care about, do you think they have any clue how much you love them? Even close. I mean, we stalked our son yesterday or the day before just to get a glimpse of him, you know. They have no clue how much we love them, how much we sacrifice for them. Now, we hope as they grow up and have families of their own, perhaps they'll get a, a feel for that. But do you ever just want to, I, don't, I almost said shake them. Uh, you ever want to just say, do you understand the love that your parents have for you? Pa Paul in this letter is trying to tell the Ephesians, you need to understand how much God loves you. That'll, that'll change your whole, that'll change the way you live. That's, that's what he's trying to communicate in today's passage, these first, uh, or last few verses in, in chapter um, one, where he is basically praying that the church that he's writing to would understand the depth of God's love and, and, and what's available to them in Jesus Christ. Last week, I think it was, or the week before at our elders meeting, we spend time praying for the church and for you all. And I left there, uh, I, I think I said it out loud even, if I, I wish the church knew how much these men care for them 
And we don't always probably do a good job of telling you that or showing you that, but there's people here that just love you and care for you. It's because of this love that it's exactly what Paul's trying to do here, communicate to people he knows and loves how much God cares for them and how much God has done for them and wants to do for them. So we start in verse 15 now, chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as, his mighty, as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. All right, that's deep stuff. Let's pray and ask God to open our eyes. God, would you do that? Would you help us to understand what Paul is writing here? Ultimately, so we can know you better as he prayed, and we can know the promise, the hope that we have in you, and we know the power, God, that you uh, have given to us. Uh, and so just, God, not only teach us this morning, but change us, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the outline is pretty straightforward. Paul's going to pray, and what he's praying specifically is that they would perceive things. So point one is praying for the saints. This is a mark of a Christian, by the way, is somebody that prays. When, when Paul got saved on that Damascus road, he sent a man God did named Ananias to go find him, and one of the marks that he would know that Paul was actually saved and converted, he says he's praying. You'll, you'll see him praying. And so Paul does that. He does it all over his, his letters. And he, he, it's just a flat-out reminder to me that we need to be praying too, period. I mean, one thing that COVID has taught us, we've done, been doing a good morning grace prayer thing every morning of the week. We've not always done that. But COVID kind of moved us to prayer. Prayer is such a great thing, and we, we, we neglect it, and we shouldn't. Um, Wednesday night we talked about Elijah, and Elijah had this uh, interchange uh, with a, the angel of the Lord that said, the journey's too great for you. That's true. The journey God has called us to go on, all of us, it's too great for us. We cannot do it by ourselves, and so we need to be praying people um, just as he is. And I liken it to how many electronic devices do you ever, how many of you have anxiety that your phone's going to run out of juice, your laptop, you're always looking for plug-ins, right? That's, we're kind of that same creation. We need to have access to the power of God all over the place. Not just, you know, if you think your phone is bad at running out of juice, so are you spiritually. And so let's not make that mistake. And he, point A here is he has reasons to pray. He says in verse 15 there, for this reason, you forget what I said last week. I forget what I said last week, but last week and a week before we talked about how incredible our salvation is that we are included in the promises of God. That's why Paul says, that's the reason here, and he gives them two specifics. He's heard about their faith in the Lord Jesus. In the Lord Jesus, This is not just the saving faith they have that brought them to salvation. This is their living out faith. They have this faith, and we've talked about what that means. You don't, it's a confidence. It's not like, oh, I sure hope so. It's a, an assurity. Um, and I had this, uh, my dog kept me up last night again, by the way. I'm going to get that thing. Um, but once I was up, you kept me up because I was thinking about this. And I'm like, how can I really communicate this? And the idea of faith, you know, you've heard faith of a mustard seed. And you don't need, it's, the, it's what it's in, not how much you have. And I thought of this picture of a spider in your car. Am I the only one that has spiders in my cars every once in a while? They'll freak you out if you're driving down the road. That spider, if you go to flick it <laughs> and not run off the road, it'll, I don't know how they do it, but they spin a web real quick and they kind of, they go away, but they're, you know, they're, they're doing their thing. They're moving 60 miles an hour down the road, hanging on to that car, if you will, by that little thread. Does that make sense? You picturing that with me? 
How does that spider go 60 miles an hour with that little thread? Because it's attached to something, a vehicle that's moving that fast. When we say we just have to have a little faith, and what he's praising them for, and what he's praying for them now is we've attached our string, if you will. We have, we have by faith attached, we've been attached to Jesus Christ. So anything that he does, not speed-wise, but the power and the prompt, the hope that we have that Paul's going to talk about, we're attached to that thing. That's the connection here. That's what we need to have is that faith. And that faith works itself out. If you continue reading in verse 15, your love for all God's people. So he looks around and he says, you guys have faith. You're practicing that faith. And it exhibits itself because you love one another. And we know that, um, you know, the Bible talks about that's how the world's going to know that we're his followers, is that we have love for one another. And Paul sees that in this church. He's excited about it. It, He knows that's a fruit of the Spirit. He knows it's the mark of a Christian. And I don't want to read this whole article, but one line came, and don't make too much of this, but uh, the article had to do with Ephesians chapter 6. We'll get there one day, but it talks about why we need the armor of God. And this is a sentence or two that jumped out at me. Whatever Satan has going on in the halls of government, government, is far less relevant than what he's up to in the chairs of your church. I'm not exactly sure what the devil thinks of the election, but I know he cares immensely that Christians hate the people they're supposed to love. Think of that. You know, a few months ago, I was worried that we were going to fight because of masks. And now, I mean, this world, we, you know this, this nation is divided to the core, and it's sometimes... And there's, there's big issues that I will fight you on, and there's others that not. But Christians need to be able to show the love of Christ, even in disagreement. And again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to make political statements here. I'm just saying the devil's won no matter who wins the election if we've divided the church. Does that make sense? And so he is, he is praising them and praying, and it causes him to say, let's pray for these guys. And he does. And then point B, this sounds pretty redundant, I guess, but remembering to pray, verse 16, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. He says this in almost every letter he writes. I think my problem sometimes is just this. I know prayer is important. I think of things, but I don't, as the point says, remember to pray. Now, how dumb am I, right? Right? I'm your pastor. I know how important it is. got to have the spider string, all that kind of stuff. I think of it, but when do I remember to pray? And he says there, I pray for all of you. I remember you. Um, I, I think he knows these people's hearts and minds, and he's praying for them specifically by name. And we just have to remember to do that. That may be in a, 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 a reminder on your phone. It may be something that just reminds you to do that. But it's also a reminder to me that most of my prayers need to be or at least the example here is for people and for people spiritually, okay? I tend to pray for what I need or people close to me need in view of material stuff, right? And he's doing a good example here, I think, of he's going to remember to pray for them and spiritual stuff. Now, here's what he prays for. So point two is the perception of the saints. Having just described the wonders of salvation, it's now as if he's going to say, here's what's true of you. I want you to know it. I want you to experience it. He's going to say, I want you to know God. I want you to know the hope to which you're called. And I want you to know the power of God. Those are three things. And so um, he, he really is asking the church there, like we would want our kids, would you just, if you could experience and, and really know how much I love you, or in his case, how much God loves you, it will change your world. It'll change the way you live and the way you act and the way you think. And the first prayer he has is the point A, to know God personally. Verse 17 says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, so this comes from God, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, in the Greek, it doesn't necessarily say the Spirit, it says Spirit. And so people bicker about, does this mean the Holy Spirit in us or just you having kind of a mind to do this? I think it's prompted by the Holy Spirit, so it's kind of a wash for me. But he wants two things. He wants us to have wisdom, okay? Wisdom is the application of knowledge, of facts. You can be really, um, I don't want to use the word smart here. You can be very informed and not be very wise, right? 
you can know all kinds of truths. If, if you know electricity will zap you and yet you stick your fingers in the outlet or start monkeying with it when you shouldn't, you're not very wise. You're smart, but you're not wise. That makes sense? And so there's a lot of Christians, and I think Paul's praying that this is not the case for us, that you use the knowledge you have in a sense that, it, that you use it wisely. And there's a couple little tricks to this. One is, as Christians, we're often accused of not being smart. The Bible says as much, that our wisdom will be foolishness to the world. And again, not to get political, you can't help it these days, right? Okay. I I thought of this. There's a phrase that gets thrown around all the time these days. Follow the science. Believe the science. That's very selective when it's used in the culture. Now, because you may disagree with what I, my conclusion on a certain issue, mask or COVID or whatever, but guess what the science also tells me? The science also tells me that, um, man, see, I'm going to get in trouble, that that's a life in a, in a womb. The science tells me that. So if I'm going to follow the science, I can't go kill babies. Amen. All right? No. no. If, I, if the science tells me, here I go. You're a boy or you're a girl. It, that's the science. And so when all I'm, tr- I'm not trying to make the political point here, although I did, I guess. I'm trying to say that Christianity is not brain-numbed. Christian, follow the science wherever you want. Because the author of that science is the Lord Jesus Christ. And wherever you look in the world that he created will point you to him. Christians, do not be afraid to be wise. And to ask questions and look for answers. Because you're going to find them all leading to Jesus Christ. He's the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And so Paul is asking that they have this wisdom. And he's also asking, and this is where we can't get too proud of ourselves, the spirit of revelation. It means we can't just find it on our own. God's got to reveal it to us. Okay? He's, got to, he's got to in some way bring it to us because we won't do that. I stumbled, I, I stumbled across so much sometimes. Thank you guys for giving me the time to study my Bible. It's great. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, there's a quote there from Isaiah 64. You'll, you'll know this phrase. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no man has mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love him. You know what the next verse says? I love this. Look it up later if you want. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Nobody can understand. Nobody can see. Nobody knows. These are the things God revealed to you by his spirit. Get that. There are things about God we cannot understand, but by his spirit, he reveals them to us. That means in the natural mind, we will never figure God out. But by his spirit, by his word, he teaches us. He reveals that stuff to us. Ultimately, again, I think that's as we come to know Jesus Christ. And the reason he says this, this will get us to our next point, is chapter, uh, verse 17, the end of it, so that you may know him better. Again, it's not just you need to be wise and you need to be smart about things about God. The end game here is that you can know him better. And the word know here means to experience him. Like I'm trying to say, I wish my kids knew how much I loved them. They would, they would probably, if I sent them a card today or a text and said, I love you, they'd probably say, I know. Right? You want you knucklehead? You don't know. I don't know if Paul, I don't know if there's a Greek word for knucklehead, but that's kind of what Paul's getting at here. You guys need to know how much God loves you because it'll, it'll change everything. And I just asked this question, how do you know somebody better? Well, you spend time with them, right? You do stuff together. You experience stuff together. And I think all that is how we know God better. We spend time with him in his word and in prayer. We serve him. We do, we're about his business, and we get to know him better. So we need to know him personally, or that's Paul's prayer here. Secondly, we need to, he's praying that he, we would know God's promises. Verse 18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, that's just a way of saying, by the way, I hope you understand this. <laughs> we just sang that song. I thought, how many of us are thinking, what does that really mean? It just means I hope you get it. That's the, that's the best I can come up with. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, if you can break that word down a little bit, that you could, um, that light would shine through, right? 
Um, you know what a photo cell is? It's what, it's what makes a motion detector work. And um, they can get dirty and they cannot detect motion. And so they get dirty. And sometimes we don't see God at work because our photo cells, if you will, are dirty. Sin or time away from him. And we don't, we, our hearts are not enlightened. Uh, Babylon B had a story this week about, I think, what was it? Motion detectors actually set off at a church service, meaning normally they, never mind. All right. I can't remember which denomination they were making fun of, maybe ours. But um, anyway, he said, I, I pray that your, the eyes of your heart may be in, enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. He's just explained that in the first part of this chapter. There's so much we've been given. Alistair Begg at at this point talks about like going on an all-inclusive cruise and eating saltines the whole time because the food looks so expensive. And somebody finally knocks you upside the head and says, it's all paid for. You can feast here. You know, you don't have to be skimping. And and kind of like the oil field illustration we used a couple of weeks ago, God has just provided so much, this glorious inheritance, the hope, all this stuff that we have. And I could give you verse after verse after verse about how we have so many treasures in God. Um, I read a story this week about William Randolph Hearst, some old guy that published newspapers. And he wanted uh, like all the, not all of them, but he liked treasures, art treasures. And so he would go around the world and he'd send his people out to find art treasures. And he had a you know, stock of them. And he, he read about a particular painting or statue or something he really wanted. So he called his agent up and said, I want you to find this thing. And he, the agent searched for several months and finally found it. It was in William Randolph, Randolph Hearst warehouse. He had, bought it several year, he had bought it several years ago. Jesus Christ purchased everything we need for holiness and godliness and to do what he's cast us to do. It's all paid for. It's in our warehouse. If I could do it, we just access it. And what Paul is praying here is that you would understand that you have access to where it's available to you. Then this is the one that this will trip with you too, or I don't know how to say that. Anyway, make your mind spin. Know God's power. This is in verse 19 and so. The reality of his power is that it's incomparably great power. It's mighty strength. He is having a tough time describing what God's power is like. I thought of Donald Trump here. It's hugely, right? It's the most bigly perfect thing you'll ever see. Here's the difference. You can never exaggerate the power and the characteristics of God. You will never go too far. So as Paul's scrambling for words here, you know, he is not exaggerating anything. He could go, he could add adjective after adjective, incomparably great, mighty, boom, boom. He could, he could spend all eternity doing that, and he will not exhaust the reality of it. He will never oversell the power that God has. It's impossible to explain it, and yet what Paul is praying for here is that we would know it. There's a there's several verses. Job has a couple of them. One talks about thunder and all that. And he says, Those, this is just the fringes of what he is. We just get a, sl- a little glimpse of, of the power of God. Verse 20, how, did we, how do we know God's powerful? Because he exerted it when he raised Christ from the dead. I've had discussions like this before with people. And this is really, the, this is, it's either true or we're to be pitied. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If God can do that, then what's your argument? What's your fear, right? If that's possible and, it's, and it happened, then you better listen to what God has to say. He's got the power to do anything. And that's what Paul's making a point here, is that he's raised him from the dead, verse 20, and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. That's, that's where a, a person in authority and power would sit. And then the neat little thing here is the whole reason, or not the whole reason, but Jesus would tell his disciples this, because he was telling them, I'm going away. And, he, and they would say, don't go, don't go. What are we going to do? And Jesus would say something along these lines. If I don't go there, I can't spend, send my Holy Spirit back here for you. I have got to go to the right hand of God. He would also, when he tells us to go share the gospel with the world, why? Because all authority rests in him and is available to us. In Acts, when he says, you're going to be my witnesses, but you've got to wait here until the power comes from on high. 
And Paul's just asking them to know this, to, to, to understand this. And again, I could give you verse after verse from all Paul's letters, most of them about that um, comes down to the end. If, if God can do that, then who can separate us from the love of Christ? Nobody can. Well, there's not only this, uh, I, what I tell you there, the um, reality of his power. Point two would be the reach of his power. This is where I got real excited. Verse 21 says it's far above all rule or rulers if you want. So I'm going to kind of give you little hooks to hang on to here. All rulers, no matter who wins this next election, is Jesus above them? Amen. Say yes. You can say no if you want. But he will still be on the throne. Okay? We may not like how that pans out. We may panic about it. But he, he is far above all rulers, all nations. He is far above all authority. I think God laughs at us sometimes because he puts all these pieces together a little bit. What are we? What are? What is our nation fighting about? Not just the election, but who's going to be what the next Supreme Court nominee, right? Well, guess what? That's not the highest court in the land. All authority belongs to Jesus Christ. Okay. All power. That kind of has the idea of weather and just all. I mean, what God can do. Guess who's in charge of all that, right? All dominion, this is interesting, I, all dominion is, uh, this has to do now with spiritual um, war and, and praying and, and all the ranks of the, uh, of the angels that Paul will talk about when it comes to spiritual war. And every name, so at the name of Jesus, every, name will, every knee will bow. If, if we had time, we would go back to Acts 19. In Acts 19, Paul who's now writing to the Ephesians, is in the town called Ephesus in Acts 19. And Paul rolls in, and people get saved. And they start burning all their books to the sorceries and all, sorcerers and all that. And, and there they tell us how much silver, it, how much valuable it is, how valuable it is. And some other people get agitated because there goes their sorcery business, Right? And they've turned the whole economy upside down. They've turned the whole society upside down because they're turning to Jesus. And they start yelling, not great as Jesus, but to counter, great as Artemis, the god of Ephesus, or one of the gods of Ephesus. And what Paul is telling the Ephesians here in the book of Ephesians is, I don't care what name they're calling out in the streets, Jesus is above that name, Amen. right? Jesus is above that name, and there's such a truth there, and it, it cuts me, it challenges me in, in how we failed in this area, but it also gives me hope, because it's too trite to say this, but the solution is people get saved. It, that's the solution to all of our problems, that people come to Jesus Christ. Where it challenges me is this is if our country's in a mess, he says somewhat sarcastically and rhetorically, part of the blame lays on us for not sharing the gospel faithfully with our friends and our neighbors, okay? The flip side is also true. Guess what can change this country around? People coming to Jesus Christ. And to Paul's point, not just them out there, but us knowing how much God loves us. Knowing how, what he's promised us, knowing the power that we have to do what's most important. Not just rally around elections, but share the gospel with people, as he explained last chapter, because some of them are appointed to eternal life and they need to hear the gospel and come to him. And then lives get changed and values change. We're gonna, we'll read this later. So we'll begin thinking the way God thinks. That's part of what he's trying to get at here. Hebrews has an interesting verse tied into this Jesus being above all things. Hebrews chapter 2. There the author says, everything's under Jesus' feet. Nothing is not subject to him. To which we ask our question, well, it sure doesn't look like it. Well, guess what the author of Hebrews said? At the present time, we don't see it. 
The author of Hebrews is saying the same thing we're having. If Jesus is up there, then why is this world in such a mess? And he says, but we see Jesus. That's what Paul is writing for. That's, my, that's what I'm begging you to. Right now, it doesn't look like he's above every name, every power, every nation, every ruler. But where should our focus be? What's our prayer here? That we see Jesus. His promises are still true. That power he offers us is still available. And I wasn't sure I was going to get this far, so this might be a little disjointed. But my third point is the recipients of his power. Look at verse 22. It's for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Up in verse 19, this incomparably great power is for us who believe. This was a little thought experiment. If, I didn't get, if this was going to be my introduction next week, here you go. If I told you you have all the power of God at your fingertips, how would you use it? If you're like me, it would be out there against them or for them. What, what he's saying is, Peter would say this as much, you have everything you need for a godly life. That incredible... If you think about it, and if I'm just now reminding of you, you of this, wouldn't a great prayer say, God, would that whole power be to kill my sinful flesh so that I can know you and serve you better, so that I can love people the way that's revealed here? That's where we need to start. That power is available for us to live godly lives. I'm not saying we don't pray about stuff out there. And the beauty of this, I think, is the example we have in Jesus Christ. I'll probably cover some of this on Wednesday night. But Jesus Christ having all that power, literally being all that power, when he came to this earth, he set it aside, and he let the powers that be crucify him. Right? He was, if we miss what is God doing here and how does the gospel come through this, then we'll miss. But we see Jesus. That's who we've got to focus on. The other thing about this is you cannot do this um, by yourself. We are his holy people. We're the church, his body. I have here in my notes, this is a difficult thing to say in a time of social distancing and quarantine, but we need each other. You're not meant to be a holy person by yourself. We need the body of Christ. What's interesting about Paul I, I, there's all kinds of interesting things in there. That's why I go on too long. Paul's the only one that calls the church the body of Christ. And again, I listen to a lot of Alistair Begg. He says at this point that maybe it's because when the Lord appeared to Paul, he says, Paul, or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul might have said, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting, here's this word again, all those knuckleheads who are following you. Jesus identifies himself with us as we're his body, right? And so Paul repeatedly will say the body of Christ, the body of Christ. We are a part of that body. We need to do that. And so here, let me get a little bit bigger here with us, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. Because you're a saint, don't think individually because we are the saints. That's how this word gets used all over the Bible. We're the part of the body of Christ. Think of this church if you want, if this is your church home. This is your body. This is Christ's body, but you're part of that body. The most immature, sinful person in this body is a part of you. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what's our role as the body of Christ? If my pinky toe hurts, I will limp. I will try to heal it. I will, whatever the issue is, I will try to do something about that. That's a picture of the body. We are collectively only as mature as we are collectively. Now, the good news is, if I'm that painful pinky toe right now, or that most sinful person in here, there are certainly some more godly people here that I can look up to, that I can learn from, that I can ask to pray for me. And collectively, I'm just as holy as they are. Now, the big picture, really big picture, is none of us are that holy, right? Praise God, we're found in Jesus Christ. That's what this letter talks about. We are holy as the body of Christ because he's holy. And he gave his body for us and we're found in him. The other thing about this is look at the end of verse 23. 
his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Jesus, Jesus Christ is the incarnation of God on earth, right? Guess who we are? We as the body of Christ are the incarnation of Jesus Christ on earth today. The old, the old joke goes like this. A man stranded out at sea prays to God, save me, and a rowboat comes by. And he goes, no, I'm praying that God will save me, right? Another boat comes by. No, I'm praying that God saves me. He dies, he drowns, he goes to heaven. And and he says, why didn't you send help? And he goes, I did. I sent a rowboat and a canoe and all this stuff. That cuts the other way, though. As I look at the world, and we're about to sing this song, it's broken. And as I pray to God to fix it, might it be that I get to heaven and say, God, I prayed often that you would do this and you would do this. And he says, I, that's why you were there. That's why I answered your prayer by putting you in that mess so that you could share the gospel, so you could love those that need to know I love them. I answered your prayer. You are the answer to that prayer. And if you're not doing that and we're just complaining and wishing that God would do something, that's how he fills the earth in every way. It's through his church. And so we've, we've got to do that. So here's how I would ask these three questions. Do you know God personally? Paul's praying for us as much as he is them. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you would know God. Again, the image of if we could just grasp how much God loves us, that'll change a lot of things. Do you know his, the promises that we have? God's faithful. He's going to do what he's going to do. One of the things he says is we're going to be holy in him. He who called us will do it. So that's part of the battle. But he's not out of control. He's not lost control. And finally, do you know the power of God? As Paul would pray here. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love. You've displayed it ultimately by sending your son to die for us. He, we know you love us because you're the sacrifice of your only son. And God, would you please join my prayers and our prayers with Paul's that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened so that we could know you better. God, maybe there's somebody here that has never known you. They've heard about you, but they've never confessed to you that they need a Savior, that their sins um, deserve your payment or your judgment. And yet in Christ, you made a way where he took their debt. So God, if somebody here needs to give their life to Jesus Christ and ask him to save them, would you move, open the eyes of their hearts to see that need? And God, for those of us that know you, that we have been saved um, by the blood of Christ, help us to know, help us to know you better, how much you love us. God, help us to know your promises and hold on to them as we hear the news stories and then uh, results of elections and all kinds of things come forward. We have a great hope and a confidence in you that has never changed and it never will. And God, help us to know your power. You are above all rulers and dominions and all that list there, every name, God. You are above them all. Help us to see you and help us to be you as we live in this world. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's kind of a song. I, I requested this, and these guys do such a great job. You, have a, you can sing along to the whole thing, but there's a response here. The first line is, do, we think, do you know the world is broken? I, I, we do, right? But follow the story of this song and just put your trust and your hope in Jesus Christ, okay? Let's stand and let's sing. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. When you know that all the dark will stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made? Yeah. 
It's all creation groaning. Here's a new creation coming. Here's the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah to comfort the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus the Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Every nation and tongue He has made us a kingdom And praise to God To reign with His Son Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Of our blessing and honor and glory Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? the praise of God there, the, my favorite line, frankly, is it's good that we remind ourselves of this. That's what Paul is praying for. That's what we're hoping for. Okay, let's pray. God, you are worthy above every to- tongue and tribe and nation. Um, and thank you for that, God. Thank you for reminding us of this this morning. You are worthy and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Is anyone worthy? Oh